Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Talking Devils podcast, brought to you by TalkingDevils.co.uk. I'm your host, Keen, joined this evening by my co-host, Reese. And again, we've lost Lee. What's going on there? But look, we'll crack on straight away. This is our Friday edition of Talking Devils podcast. Obviously, this is usually the Phil and Lee podcast, joined by Reese. But as it's the penultimate game of the season, we're spicing it up. We're going full X-Reds. So I have my co-host, Reese, and today we are joined by three former Manchester United players. We're joined by Marcus, we're joined by Lee, and we're joined Mr. Phil Marsh as well. So myself and Reese are, have very esteemed company here today. It's great to be here this evening. So, you know, we're on a podcast on the back of a win. Who would have thought? We haven't been on a podcast on the back of a win in a long time. So look, we, we'll, we'll chat about that as well. We're going to chat about Harry Maguire. We're going to chat about the Jesse Lingard situation. And also, we're going to chat about the future of Cristiano Ronaldo and where he fits in to Eric Ten Hag's plans. But I will go around the table. Um, Reese, good to have you with me, pal. Good to be my co-host here this evening. How are you, my friend? How's your week been? Uh, uh, rough week. Rough Just week. got back in for drinking after work. And I don't usually drink, but I went drinking with some colleagues, so... Full blaze turn up Edinburgh made Edinburgh my bitch, and I've just got in from a long day's work. So um, I'm actually quite good actually. So and I don't look drunk. I don't feel drunk. I just feel great. So that's good. That's we'll, 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 we'll be the judge of that. We'll be the judge of that. <laughs> we'll be the judge put this, of that. Put this, put, put it this way, lads. I've just had eight pints of Peroni. Not bad, mate. Not bad. Not bad at all. And I'm not a drinker, and Keen knows that. I'm not a drinker. Being from Scotland, I hope you've had uh, eight whiskey shot chases after that too. Not tonight. Maybe <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow. Reese is still celebrating off the back of Rangers win the Europa League last night, by the way. I think that's probably why he went to the pub this evening. But, Marcus, haven't seen you in a while, pal. How's, every, how's everything? How are you keeping? Everything is good. Thanks. Thanks, Keen. A lot of things to do with my team. Uh, a lot of things to plan for for the next season as we're going to take over the under-14s as a head coach. So there's there's a lot of things to do. Last night I was covering with the Swiss broadcast uh, the Rangers game and also the Eintracht Frankfurt game against uh, against West Ham. And um, yeah, it was a good week of football, international football, and uh, hopefully United going to be involved soon again. Yeah, <laughs> United win the Europa League next year. You heard it here first. Yeah, well, look, we, we'll chat about that in terms of where United's a season's permutations are in terms of where it'll be, whether it's Europa League or Conference League. But you know, look, as you're a very busy man, Marcus, and we were all just discussing off air what you're doing with your coaching stuff stuff as well. So absolutely fair play to you, though. Keep it going, pal. Thanks, Lee. Mate. Lee, been a while, been a week. We were very pessimistic last week in terms of what way the result could go. We're, we're on a podcast. I'm in a good mood. We all seem to be in a good mood this week. My United got three points. How's that oh. contributing to your weekly? How are you? I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic than I was uh, maybe most of the season, if I'm being honest, mate. You know, um, we've been a bit doom and gloom, haven't we, on this podcast for the last six to eight months, I would say. Um, nothing looked like we'd give us any idea that we was going to actually start playing a bit of football. So, you know, it was nice to not just get a win, but get an half-decent performance too, you know, on, on the back of it. So... It made my week a little bit uh, a little bit nicer and a little bit more cheerful. I'm sure it'll make the podcast a little bit more cheerful tonight. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of positive things to take from that win on Monday. And look, we will there was a few points we will talk about as well. Obviously, following the game. Mr. Marsh, you've been very busy at your football lately. Your season's come to a close. Obviously similar similarly to Manchester United. How are you, pal? Yeah, all good. Thanks, Keen. Um as you say, yeah, season's finished for me now, so just sort of a bit of downtime to sort of have a bit of relax before pre-season will be starting up again. Um, so, yeah, just enjoying that. Uh, and obviously, great to see United's performance last week. I thought it was probably one of the best performances we've seen in a long time. So, um, didn't get as much stick as I usually get from some of the kids in school who sport Liverpool. Um, so, yeah, it was, was, uh, was good to sort of uh, have something to, you know, Give them a little bit back with. So looking forward to the next performance. Yeah. What about the set of kids? There's not many of them, to be honest. 
was only, it was only a couple of them. So, yeah, they, they've been a bit quiet, as you can imagine, after the other night. Um, yeah, I think I think the numbers in Stockport's risen since well, Wednesday, so I think we all know why. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But look, we won't be talking about Manchester City tonight. This is Talk Devils. This is a Manchester United podcast. We're talking all things United tonight. So, also it's on the back of Wayne's comment here as well. Wayne's also joined us here from LA. He's on holidays. I hope you're doing well, Wayne. Wayne says, "Evening, lads. Well, afternoon here in LA. Hope you're all well. Great to see Marcus on." He must, he must be selling plenty of books being LA. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> He'd definitely be the right salesman in LA, 100%. But we're here to talk all things United. And for today's podcast, I really wanted to get the ex-players I've been doing podcasts with all season, obviously, Marcus, Phil and Lee, on with me and Reese here today because... It's been a kind of a mad season. And look, I, I, what I will be doing kind of towards the end of the show is... I'll be asking everyone who their standout player of the season is, and we will talk a bit about the youngsters and what their hopes will be for next season. So I will be bringing that up to you kind of towards the end of the show. And Wayne says, soul, body, organs, more like. Yeah, I suppose the in- inflation is happening in the US at the moment, Wayne, so you might make a good few quid there. But anyway, moving on. <laughs> We're, here to talk all- We're here to talk all things United here today, so... I suppose, Reese, I'll come to you first in terms of the, the Brentford game. Yeah. Very good win the other night, obviously, you know, mm-hmm. on the back of a couple of performances where we have under underperformed. There was a lot, lot of talk went into the game, obviously. We, we've had the fan protests. Um, the results haven't been, haven't been great as of late. Some of the performances have been okay. Um, but, like, this game against Brentford was a really, you know, I suppose, had the potential to be a banana skin. Um, could have been a, a proper slip-up, but what was your overall thoughts, I suppose, on the performance um, over 90 minutes? Because it seems like, I said this the other day, I thought it was our probably best performance since Ralph's come in, in terms of like a full sustained period of pressure we've put on a team. Um, what was your overall thoughts on the performance? And also, Manchester United realising that Juan Mata is a number 10 and not a white player. Funny that, it took a decade. Worst joke I've ever heard by a pundit. One Matt as a winger. Yeah, try telling Man United that. Um, but overall, I agree. By far our best performance all season, which is a shock. Um, it's controlled, disciplined, and it's the style of football that I like. I've always admired the German style, like pressing the ball, controlling the ball with tempo, dictating half spaces, and the most of all, it was involvement from the whole team for a change. I still think there was a few players that may have been a little bit shaky, but everybody was involved and actually put a shift in, which was great. My only my only issue with this performance is where was this performance five weeks ago? Where was this performance two months ago? Where was this performance literally when it mattered? Like, why do we have to wait until the last home game of the season for professional footballers to realise what their job is? Like, it's... It, it baffles me, but I still thought it was a great performance, but you've still got to have that in the back of your mind that it took them so long just to realise that we expect them to work hard. We want them to understand what it means to play for Man United, and it took them until the very last home game of the season to understand that when we had nothing to play for except pride. And... But all in all, I thought it was great. And I thought Juan Mata was exceptional. I thought bar Ronaldo, like nobody, nobody really touched Mata's performances. Like, I thought maybe Bruno Matic were equally good, but Varane comfortable in the game. But as a whole, Mata had ever, like anything you can think of involvement, Mata was involved. And it's no benefit to Ronaldo other than, other than Ronaldo himself because he got the service he's been craving all season. So yeah, it was fantastic. And I've said it a month and a half ago that Fernandez on the left wing is going to be his best position and no coincidence he was absolutely flourishing as a as a Roman player from the left hand side so next season don't play him as a number 10 just don't play him on the left so it was, yeah he, he, it was he did do well that in, inside left channel he did pick up a bit of space I think him and Juan Mata interchanging positions you know it did obviously help in terms of our build-up play um Marcus a lot of talk this season's obviously been about kind of our, our midfield. 
um, this season. And when you looked at the performance the other night against Brentford, obviously we had Nemanja Matic, Scott McTominay and Juan Mata as our midfield trio. Now, whereas it was a good performance and it was good sustained over 90 minutes, when you look at Eric Ten Hag coming in, Marcus, do you think when you look at Man United's midfield that we're going to need massive recruitment? Because it looks like with the style of play he wants to play, the, the personnel we don't we have in there doesn't fit the profile of an Eric, Eric Ten Hag midfield. Yeah, definitely. And uh, in my opinion, I'm a little bit... I see it differently than Reese because I think the Brentford game is not the standard that United is looking for. I mean, they played against a team who is not fighting for relegation, who is not fighting for the Europa League. Okay. So they, they were not a team to really to compete. And um, if you're talking about Fernandes playing on the left wing, I think if you play him against Chelsea and against Arsenal, uh, against teams who play higher up the pitch, it's very difficult for him to to uh, to run into the spaces because he's not the fastest player in the world. And sure. with his quality, um, I think if you play against better teams, he's not the kind of guy who gives you the depth in the in the in the offensive and even in the defensive side. And we talked about it before with Ronaldo and Fernandes to play on the pitch. If you want to play high intensity football against a team who is fighting, who has a intensity in their game, not like Brentford at the weekend because they were not fighting for anything. Um, then, then I think it will be very difficult to see that kind of football that United played against Brentford. Of course, against inferior teams, it's always easier to play uh, with Fernandes on the left wing and even with Ronaldo. But um, if you have a more equalised opponent, then it will be very difficult for them to compete. And I think Eric Ten Hag knows that. Um, I think he's looking for different uh, player profiles in that position. And um, Fernandes has played more most of his career in the central position. And I think his qualities with his passing ability, with his vision, with his scanning is uh, is very is very uh, very good. And um, therefore, I don't I don't see him on playing on the wing because there you need pace if you want to compete against the big teams. I mean, if if you watch uh, City or Liverpool. I mean, if you watch the, if you compare the players there on the left and right wing with Sané, uh, Salah, with uh, even with Mare, with Sterling, I mean, they're different kind of players. And if you want to compete in the highest, highest league, you need a different profile there. But uh, Eric Ten Hag knows, and it will be very, very, very interesting to see what players he's going to bring in. I think he's not going for the big names. I think he will bring in even in centre midfield. He will bring fresh young legs who can cover a lot of ground because uh, for that type of of transition game that uh, Rangnick and United are looking for, even with Ten Hag, he needs uh, players who can cover the field and have also qualities on the ball. And they are not the likes of Pogba or Fernandes uh, and even Matic. And uh, therefore, it will be very interesting to see what names will be uh, in the media the coming weeks and days. You mentioned it would be interesting in terms of like names who have been floated around the media. Calvin Phillips from Leeds United has been someone who's been floated around. Obviously, he's been known as obviously a, a midfielder who, who can tackle. He's very mobile and he's decent with ball retention. Do you think he'd be a, a right fit for United's midfield at this moment in time in terms of obviously said not a big name, but someone who'd probably fit though, the ethos of an Eric Ten Hag system? Yeah, I think because Eric Ten Hag is a similar coach than, than Ferguson. He likes central midfielders who can... Yeah, Play, who can, how you say it, who can uh, deliver both sides of the games offensively and defensively. You know, if you watch a few years ago with Scolzi and Keane, um, with Nicky Bott, they had both sides. You know, offensively they could score goals, defensive wise they were always there. And if you compare the, the midfield now with Matic, he's very good defensively, offensively he's not really good. If you see Pogba, uh, some days he's, he's okay in both both ways, but then the other day he's missing the intensity in defensive completely. So I think Ten Hag is looking for relying players where he can rely on what he can get out of them. You know, he wants players who to, to, to push into the world class and not players who think or are already in the top draw. And therefore, I think the, 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 the player from Leeds is very interesting. He's not uh, on top of his game yet. He's quite young. Um, he proved it also in the, in the England team. And um, therefore, I think these are the kind of players that he's been looking for in the next weeks. 
Yeah, definitely. I think Calvin Phillips, if you're looking at the number of players who can play in the six for United next season, I think he's definitely someone who should be considered. I mentioned on social media a couple of weeks ago. Um, obviously, I think it'd be a hard deal to do because if, if Leeds stay up, I think it's a hard deal to do. If they go down, I think United could sign him. Obviously, similarly to how we signed Alan Smith though, back in 2004, 2005. I think you know that could be a similar situation. If Leeds do go down, Callum Phillips can be a deal that could be done. Lee, obviously with a Ten Hag system, I know we've talked about the fullbacks recently, and obviously you being a former fullback yourself, when you see the performances of our oh, wait, fullback, <laughs> <laughs> why are you fullback, Marcus? Fly you were always fullback. there. No, no, he was not the fullback. He was always up there, the left wing with Marcy on the right. Don't tell him he was a left. No, no, no. <laughs> sorry, Keen. Sorry, but I had to mention. Yeah. It's I, all right. I, I, I like right. being involved. That was my problem. I just like being involved at both sides of the pitch. <laughs> in terms, in terms of like obviously the fullback position, Lee, it's been um. A problem position for United this season and probably has flown under the radar um, in terms of the other problems we've had, obviously, through the midfield and, and central defence. But you look at our four fullbacks at the minute Tele, Shaw, Dalo, Wambazaka. You know the way ra- ra- uh, sorry, Ten Hag wants to play with kind of fullbacks who are good on the ball, who can also tuck in and obviously play as an inverted fullback as well. When you look at our four fullbacks, who of you at the moment th- you think will play under Ten Hag and may get a chance? Because for me, I'm only looking, there's only probably two out of the four who I think he might keep. And that's at a stretch. But if, we, who, if you were sitting in Ten Hag's position right now, Lee, who would you who, who would be on your mind in terms of keeping next season for the fullback it's, positions? It's a really good question, Keen. And to be honest with you, I'm not 100% sure because I agree with everything Marcus just said about the midfield players. Um about we've not got midfield players anymore like a Scholes or, a, a, you know, a Keane who, who can do all their own stuff, as in they can defend and they can attack. That goes with the full-backs. We've either got full-backs who can defend and not attack, or who's really good at whipping a ball in, who's not got a clue with positional sense and don't know what to do with defending. So it's a hard one because, like I've said it a couple of times on the podcast, if you could mix, put a mixture of Dalor and wan as one player, and you could do the same with Luke Shaw... And tell us you'd have a decent fullback on both of them, but unfortunately we can't do that. For me, not one of them is good enough to be a Man United fullback, in in my opinion. Um, they've got potential. Um, Luke Shaw, when he does, when he is on form and he's fit and he's playing well, and I said this last week, he's one of the best fullbacks in the country. But we don't get consistent performances off any of our fullbacks whatsoever. Not what would think, yeah, he's, he, you know, he he's, he deserves to be in there and he's he's a storm. Stonewall starting eleven. Um, I, I feel like if, if, unless he tries, tries rather no, or when Ten Hag comes in and tries a few of the young lads out in free season to see if they can do any better, i.e. Fernandez, um, etc. You know, I think he's going to have to go into the market and, and you know probably buy, um, which he's going to have to do in most positions. I, I, I don't think there's many of the of the squad that's going to fit a Ten Hag, you know, a Ten Hag system or a Ten Hag style of play. Um, which I don't think it's any surprise. I think we're, we're all under the impression that there's going to be a, a lot of movement with the squad and the starting eleven. You know, we might keep a few squad players and a few might start in the eleven, but I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of uh, the players now. What you're going to see consistently starting next season, especially the season after when he's had a full season to recruit. Um, so for me, if I was had to pick two, I think potentially would be the better of of of, of both. Of both, both sides, I would I would be picking Shaw over Tellez, and I would probably pick Wan Bissaka over Dallow at the moment. That oh, yeah, that's, sorry, mate, that's sorry, exactly mate. my pro, uh, thought process, Lee. Because I look at Luke Shaw, and I think with the role Daily Blind plays with um, Ajax in terms of how he talks in, I think Luke Shaw can do that because he has experience of playing in the back three as left side as centre back when the full when the right back bombs forward. So, like, I think for me. Luke Shaw can definitely do, do that role in that formation, in, the, in that Ten Hag formation. I think wan I think, definitely deserves a chance because I think one thing wan probably has lacked in the last kind of two, three years at United is an elite coach. He hasn't got elite coaching. I think he has showed in parts that he can be a very good fullback. And I think under Ten Hag, under an elite coach, I think he can develop 
I think there's I, I the think, better. I think, I think. I mean, I don't know if United's got one or not at the moment, but it looks to me as though they're lacking a defensive coach. Where I know when I was playing and Phil and obviously Marcus, they were more attacking than me. But we we used to get you know we used to get pulled aside the back four to you know to work on positional sense and to work on tucking when you full uh, sorry your centre backs when the ball gets played up and things like that. It looks like United at the minute are, are, are missing that because. Some of the the errors that they produce positional wise in you know in a, all the way across the back four, it's criminal and sometimes it's schoolboy errors what what's going on and it I, like I say maybe if they brought a coach you know they focus someone to to get Wan Bissaka and players like that you know to to realise what what positional sense they should be in and, and get more of a tight back four. It, it's got the potential you know he's a great defender one on one. He's quick. Sometimes he's dreadful on the ball, but sometimes I think I mentioned it on the podcast. Sometimes it can look prime Barcelona and sometimes it can look prime Conference League. You know what I mean? It, it depends what move he's in. So I think as if he gets gets coped well and gets the doubts out of his mind what he should and shouldn't be doing, we might we might even see a play in him. I think a point a point I got is you know when you, when you think back about a time when we were there, you know, I'm not saying Gary Neville or Phil Neville or all of them. They were bad players, but I think if there weren't likes of Scholes or Keane in the middle of the park who were so consistent in their performances, you know, they made players around them much better. Yes, I think if you put Gary Neville now on the right side in his best days, I think he wouldn't be better than Juan Bissaka or mm-hmm. than Luke Shaw, you know, you, you get what I'm saying. So I think yes. if, so I think one of the main points is to have a strong midfield, a strong centre with uh, a lot of experienced and good quality players and they make the players around them more valuable and much better. You know what I mean? And yeah. I think if you talk about left back and right back positions, there are so many players who can play there and you don't need to spend a lot, a lot of money. You know what I mean? It's it's in the... Oh, in the in, in, and in that the, communication. In style, yeah, and in the style of, Tan ha- of Ten Hag. He, he wants young players who can de- develop, but you cannot develop young players in the middle of the park. You know, you need experience. You need players with a lot of courage, who has who have the, the right mentality, the right idea, the right approach. And that, that is missing at the moment. And United sure. I- has ever been so good when people in the middle of the park were strong. And I'm missing that completely at the moment. Yeah, I think I think you, you've hit the nail on the head there, Mark, because I totally agree. And, and going on and following on to what you're saying there, I think, like I said, the, the days when we were there, with, with obviously the reserves and the first team, uh, we've mentioned it more or less week in, week out on this podcast, is we all played for each other. We all played as a team and we all worked hard for each other. So, say, for example, one of the guys was having a bad game and, and, and we sniffed that out and we knew that he was having a bad game. Yeah. You'd work that little bit harder to cover around and to help that guy out. And I think that's what's been missing a lot this season. They all seem to play for themselves. They don't seem to play for, you know, for, for each other. They don't seem that there's much team spirit there or, you know, co- cohesion. And I think that's missing too, you know, what's been missing for probably a, a good five or six years now too. Yeah, I've but you know, when it was missing, when it was missing on the pitch, who were the players who, who forced it, you know? It was Keane, it mm-hmm. was Scholes, it yeah. was Giggs yeah. who made the others work their bollocks off, you know? And that's, that's what I mean. There are no real... Um, experienced players in the middle of the park who make the others work harder, you know. And there are always situations in a game when it gets even tougher, you know. When you because there are always different phases of the of the game. Sometimes it's running for you, sometimes it, it it doesn't. But then you need the experienced players to step up and take the courage and take the younger players aside, you know. And this has been missing for such a long time, I think. I got a question just on Wan Bissaka. Actually, I think Lee, you're probably the best. See. See, when I watch him play and I look at him driving forward, he doesn't give me the confidence of a, a fullback who wants to play in a progressive team. He seems to still have that Crystal Palace mindset, but he still thinks he's playing in a low, a low block. He's playing that, like a defence that's based on just building on a counter. I don't think he actually... It might, I don't know if it's the lack of coaching. Or it, might, it could be the lack of coaching, but... When I look at a fullback play that has confidence in a progressive team, they want to drive forward, whether they cut into the middle or they go far forward where they can get a cross in. Wan Bissaka doesn't give me that confidence. Like he just seems to be afraid to drive forward with the ball. Like he's afraid to take a man on. And as soon as an attacker comes near him, he just passes the ball and hopes that the ball is going to be come back and where he can put a tackle in. I don't know if you get that same mindset, but for me, he just seems afraid to progress. Is, is I don't he- think- it's, it probably is, it seems like he, he's got a lack of confidence in his own ability. You know, the yeah. lack of confidence though of his own ability. I mean, 
he always, always backs himself one on one in defending, you know, and he, he doesn't seem like yeah. he's lost his, his confidence there. But when when you watch him, like say he goes up top, it looks like like so you don't know if it's modern day pressures with obviously even social media and people ripping him on this, that and the other, whether that gets to him, you don't know. I mean, I, we didn't experience it when we played, so I can't answer that question whether, you know, the, the focus now on, on every game and every minute of the perk when you're on there with social media and you've run so many miles and you've lost so many passes, that wasn't there when we was playing. You've either had a good game or a bad game, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and that was it. So there's a lot of modern day pressures there. He's probably worried that the stats when he's going up top aren't the best. So he's thinking, well, instead of me giving another ball away or getting tackled or putting a shite cross in, I'll just turn back and pass it back, you know what I mean? And do the easy things. I think sometimes we, football now for me has become overcomplicated. It's gone from being a game to every little inch of uh, aggression cover on the pitch being scrutinised and, you know, there being a stat for it. And to me, sometimes we just overcomplicate it. We should just get on that pitch and play 11 be 11, do the best you can do and you have a win or lose and, and, and that's it. You know, it's, it's a game at the end of the day. Um, and so I think that, that it's, that's kind of got lost in transition, translation quite a lot. Yeah, I agree. Appreciate that. Appreciate that response though. But just like when I'm watching him play, like I do get that genuine worry where if you put him, as Marcus alluded to earlier on, but certain players you alluded to, Man City, you alluded to Liverpool as two very good progressing teams. You put Juan Bissaka in that team and immediately they, they just collapse because he doesn't progress he doesn't progress the ball really well, and no, no, look at look at Dan James. It's just that. Look at look at Dan James. Yeah, Alexander Arnold. There's two, there's two massive comparisons there. They're probably yeah. the best in the country at the moment. They Definitely. get the ball. They get the ball out wide. You know they're putting a quality pass in. And I mean, sorry, not Dan James. Reese James. Sorry, I said Dan James. You know, um, you what you watch them too as a fullback, and you know the the they're absolute quality. You know, they're the kind of the guys that United for me. If we're going to progress, that's the kind of fullbacks we need, and unfortunately, we've not got them at the moment. I agree. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if he dips into the Dutch market for a fullback or two. Yeah, I think he'd, he's probably look at Ajax, probably look at Timber. I'd say that's probably who he's probably going to look at because that's the rumor straight away. But Phil, I, I want to come to you um, in terms of the forward areas. Um, obviously, you and Marcus were both we lost Lee again. <laughs> obviously, you and Marcus were both forwards go forwards at, at the football club. Phil, I just want to come to you first and obviously Cristiano Ronaldo because reports today um, suggest from the Telegraph that Eric Ten Hag wants Cristiano Ronaldo to be an, an integral part of the Man United squad next season. Now, obviously, we know Ronaldo in the last couple of months has really picked his form back up. His goal scoring, Joe, has been up there. Even tracking back and winning the ball back, his work rate seems to have has increased well, I'd say by about 20-25% in the last kind of you know, six weeks or so. When you look at Ronaldo and you look at the way Ten Hag plays, and then you look at also United maybe recruiting a couple of like younger players, you think it's integral that Cristiano's leadership as like an experienced player is needed in addressing not only just his quality? Yeah, most definitely. I think obviously just going off the Ten Hag style and obviously the way he's going to you know, build for the future. Obviously, Cristiano Ronaldo doesn't really fit the profile for, for sort of a player that would be his type of player. But obviously, as you've just said there, and, and the sort of amount of goals he scored this season in a, in a you know, one of the poorest Man United teams that, you know, we've seen in a long time, I think it's crucial that we, we keep him for as long as we can and as long as he's delivering what he's been delivering. Um, not only for his goals, as you've just said there, I think, you know, he's he's professionalism, his leadership skills. Obviously, you know, a lot of the younger players will be looking up to him. Um, you see Ganacho and people like that now who obviously, you know, idolise someone like that, which, you know, obviously, you know, why wouldn't you? He's, he's probably the best player that, you know, has ever lived. Um, but yeah, I just feel as though, for me, obviously, if he does stay next year, we are going to need to um, get more players around him who are going to be a little bit more mobile because although he does chase back and, you know, he's, you know, 37 and he does put a shift in majority of the times. I think we are going to need, if we are going to be pressing high, a lot more players with a lot more energy and um, commitment and desire around Cristiano to, to allow him that freedom to do his thing. I mean, I can, you know, testify to that. I mean, I'm, I'm getting on myself now. We've got a lot of young players in the team I play for. I know I'm not going to be running around for 90 minutes like I used to be able to because I'm I'm not fit enough. I'm not old enough to do that anymore. But 
to have that little bit of experience and that little bit of quality at the top end of the pitch and you've got lads around you who can do maybe the little bit of extra running and, and make them runs in behind. Somebody like Cristiano who's got that vision and that ability to put the ball in the back of net is, is going to be crucial, I think, for United sort of building and, and making that next step to getting to where you know, we want to be. It's obviously not going to be a, a straightforward process in terms of you know the next year we're going to be back challenging by any stretch. But I think Cristiano is somebody who will lead us into that next um, sort of stepping stone in the right direction just by being at the club and offering all the things that I think we've talked about there as well as his goals. You know, he's, he's a great person. You know, we, we were lucky enough to, um, you know, share a training pitch with him at, at times. And obviously, you know, we got to see him and, and his work rate, his dedication, the amount of effort he puts in on and off the pitch to make himself the best he can be. And obviously, we've seen the longevity of his career and how many, you know, goals and trophies he's won. He's, he's somebody who we need to, you know, try and make the most of until he's ready to move on. Um, so, yeah, massive, massive um, part of the club, I think, for this season, obviously, towards the end of it. And, and you know, next season, hopefully, to help some of these younger players. Mar uh, Marcus, I just want to come to you just on, on the back of what Phil said there. Obviously, We've, um, a, 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 I suppose, a very great crop of young players who have just come through. Obviously, our under-18s have got to the FAU Cup final. Obviously, a couple of them players have got into the first team. Or uh, first team, obviously, the likes of Hannibal Medri, Joe Alejandro Garnacho, Joe Anthony Alanga has recently gone into the squad. And he seems to have like a good relationship with Ronaldo. And he was speaking on the Man United podcast last week in terms of Ronaldo helping him on the training ground, helping him deal extra things obviously in terms of nutrition and do you know, all that other stuff in terms of working on stuff do you know, after training do you think someone with the wealth of experience of Ronaldo albeit yes he's going to be 38 next season and he might not be playing every game like he used to be but do you think going through a transitional period that you need leaders in the dressing room because Phil Phil has pointed out and you've quite rightly pointed out as well earlier on the podcast that yes we're probably struggling for lead leaders and yes maybe Cristiano might be capable of playing every game, especially if we're, if we're playing Thursday nights next season. But do you think during the rebuilding process and helping maybe some of the younger players develop into men at the football club that a character like Ronaldo though, will be needed? Yeah, I think definitely because um, we have to be also honest and also be more really clear about the situation. I think in summer they won't sign 20 new players you know there are a lot of people with uh, running contracts uh, sometimes there's not a situation to sign the player that ten Hag is looking for, looking for so we saw that a few years ago when Jurgen Klopp arrived you know he, he also needed two or three transfer windows to get all the, the the players that he wanted you know and I think with Cristiano Ronaldo the, the thing is with him I think you have to be honest with him. You have to tell him that, that what his role will be, what he has to do, and um, to be very clear and honest about it, you know. And I think then, then, then there's a big chance that they're going to be a good output for everybody because uh, a player with his experience, with his worth, working ethic, you know, you, you, you don't have that very often. And people, and especially players, look up to him. And this is very important to have it in the dressing room, even if you want to educate younger players to make their way through to the first team. So you need these kind of idols in your dressing room they, they can talk to and uh, not necessarily always on the pitch, also off the pitch, you know. It's, it's not always that uh, your game when you step off the pitch is over. You Even when you're younger, you have to le learn even more beside the pitch than off the pitch. Not many people understand that. I understood that also quite late in my career, but I had a great benefit afterwards, you know. So the sooner you learn about it, the better it is. And I think if you have, play if you can have players like him, um, I think there's no doubt about it that that they're going to be a big benefit for the younger players. But he has to accept his role, and he has to be very clear that he won't play every game, every single minute, you know, because with his anger and his enthusiasm. I think it's not always easy to to cope with as a coach, you know. So it will be a big demand also for Ten Hag to find the right balance and also to find the right um, approach to him because uh, otherwise it can be also be very negative if you have such a big name in your in your in your squad. Yeah, I think it's, you, you hit the nail on the head there. I think it's about finding the right balance and 
I think obviously Ronaldo being that big character, I think every like big player has an ego, right? Look, that that's just a fact of life. Anyone who is established as Ronaldo, you're gonna have an ego, right? And quite rightly so, he's he's Cristiano Ronaldo for God's sake. You're gonna have that. He, like he's one of the greatest of all time, if not the greatest. Like you know, like you're gonna have that. But I think obviously. I think as experienced as he is, he will know that he can't play every game. Especially, like, look, if we end up in Europa League or the Europa Conference League next season. To be fair, if we end up in the Conference League, I don't want to see Ronaldo play one minute of football until probably the semi-final, to be fair, if we get there. Now, I know I'm talking well ahead, right? I'm going well ahead. And the comment section, every coming at me saying, Keen, you're looking well ahead. But, look, I'm just being honest. United are in that week. Pike can play our youngsters or our fringe players probably up until maybe outside the group stage. Do you know what I mean? But for Cristiano next season, I think it's very important to be playing him in all the Premier League games next season. Do you know what I mean? I think, and maybe in some yeah. European games, depending yeah, on... I, how I don't see it especially this way, but the, the, the benefit of the situation we're going to have in the next season is that you're going to have a lot of games. You know, you, you play every three, four days. And uh, the good part of United still is that they have an ex exceptional good academy, you know, and we're, we're still producing quality players, but you need to give them a platform, you know, and I think Ten Hag is a, is a kind of guy who knows how to introduce young players into the game, you know, and it's even nicer, like if you watch Liverpool, they were building a big team and young players even find their way, like uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold, you know, he was also a young player nobody had on the radar, you know, so I think even with United, they, they, they don't have to watch that far to, to have a plan, but they want what they have to do. And I think with the young players they have, they just need to put them in the right shape. And with Ronaldo, it's always difficult, you know. We, we don't know his plans. Maybe Ronaldo has different plans for himself. We have to wait. It's not always what the club wants, but it's also very important what, what Cristiano wants, you know. I, I was literally, I was, just, I was just thinking that myself, Marcus. It's, it's not necessarily what we want as a club. It's what... Cristiano Ronaldo's ambitions are still at 37 years old. Um, mm -hmm. Like I say, he's been our top goal scorer this this year, and he's still banged the goals in for us. And he might not want to sit on the bench. You know, he's been the best of all time. He might not be wanting to slow down and have the realization that you know he's aging. He, you know, he might want to go over to America and still start and still look absolutely phenomenal. That's, or, you know, back that's, to why said, that's why I said you have to be honest with him. You have to be honest with him yeah. from the first minute. Otherwise, you're going to create problems for him, for the club, and for the whole team. So, I, I, say, I think if he's prepared to take a little bit of a backseat and become a mentor and you know play the big games and fair enough, I just can't see it. Cristiano Ronaldo, even at 37, wanting to do that. I think that he'll still want to be the main focus in any team he plays for. Yeah, I think so as well. So, because yeah. so. if he's actually, I think he's yeah. going to want to keep trying to play as many games as he can to score yeah. as many goals to you know secure his status as probably being the greatest of all time and you know his records yeah. what have you so, yeah. I suppose it's a little bit like Cavani when Cavani's come out this week and he said he, you know if he knew that Ronaldo was signing a week before he signed his contract he wouldn't have signed it because obviously Cavani wanted to be the main pivotal point for United strike force unfortunately like I said Ronaldo coming in had to take a bit of a back step players like your Cavani's and your Ibrahimovic's and your Ronaldo's these type of players they want to they want be the main guys all through the career yeah. they don't want to be sat on the bench and you can't blame them because they've you know they've been they've been the world best you know and it, it's 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 a massive culture shock for them to be starting and to be known as the world's best player to then be sitting on a sitting on a bench it, they're not going to want that I think, but I think know, I'm but you know, Lee, just to interrupt you shortly, we talked about the podcast about that situation. You know, when when United was so successful, we never talked about the players, we always talked about the team. You know, exactly. in the last 10 15 years, we just talk about who they're going to sign in the transfer window, which big names, because the whole supporters they just jump on names, you know. And I think the name Manchester United is there, but they have to create the spirit, they have to create a team again. And yeah. then it doesn't matter if there's a Ronaldo or a Cavani or somebody else is up front. You know, it sounds very difficult to understand, but uh, for me, yeah. that's the main point. Yeah. We, we've we've said, we're, about this, com completely agree with you, mate. We've said it with, with Keane all season that what we need to do, before we even knew that we were sending, signing Ten Hag, we said what we need to do, the next manager doesn't need to sign just names. You know what I mean? He needs to sign yeah. potential uh, and someone what's going to fit into the, the new manager's, you know, philosophies and, you know, what he wants them to do. Don't just sign people because they've been world-class because 
you might sign a world class player, but he might not fit the you know the standard of what the manager wants. He's got he's got to fit into that team structure. So I totally agree with you, mate. We we can't be looking for just big names anymore. We need to find the right fit. It's got to be building a team structure by structure. And I alluded yeah. it to Keane, I think maybe in a month ago. Like United in the summer, it's not just about doing names. United should literally just follow. You could follow two routes, basically. You could follow the Liverpool route about data analysis and physically and continuously analyse a player consistently. Like, Luis Diaz has came in January and he's already a contender for player of the season in six months because of his hard work to Liverpool. Although, player, player of the season after six months for me is a bit... No, for me, it's all about full season. But his impact has been fantastic for them. Or you can do the City route. You buy players really young and you know they're going to develop over time for the year. They, they write, not necessarily write them off, but over the year, you know they're not, they're not going to be great, but they'll play their part. And in the second season, they'll kick on into the team because they fit Pep's style and it, it works for them as a transition. But I think, the, I think one thing United should do, whoever we sign or not, when it comes to youth players, I think, I think funnily enough, we should look to, to set his example of how Pep used Phil Foden. If there's a certain player in your team that you think can get into your team, don't loan them out. Use them sporadically. Have them on the bench. Bring them on at certain times, like last 10, 15, 20 minutes. Let them have a feel of the game. And then if it's a cup game, like Carabao Cup or the FA Cup final, give them six... Not FA Cup final, but an FA Cup game, sorry. Give them 60, 70 minutes. Let them have a feel. And then gradually upon time, give them like maybe like a 90 minutes here or there, play them in a European game, see how they handle the situation. And then if a player's sold, rather than sign a big player, be like, well, you know what, you've been in and around the team, you've been working hard, boom, there's your chance. I think basically United should look towards the Foden example because it's worked perfectly for City. Unfortunately, it's, it's disgusting for us. But it's a great example of how to use a youth player is Pep's handling of Phil Foden for the past three years because he's now, I wouldn't expect to say the David Silva heir to his position, but the way he's filled it, David Silva's one of the best players I've ever seen, but right now he's filling that gap really well because he's he's learned from them. And I think even as a young striker coming through, Ronaldo would be a great example of just keeping around. Like We're not going to have a lot of striker options, but Imagine you're a young the... Charlie McNeil and you're looking at Cristiano Ronaldo on the Learn training from ground. that. Exactly. You can play Charlie McNeil in a cup game or use him in a European competition like here or there, like given the time. Save Ronaldo for like the big games if you have to use him in Europe or the league games. Give McNeil or whoever who's going to be the backup option off the bench against like, no disrespect, but the likes of Burnley. Like that sort of opponent where it's a low block, it's a difficult opposition. Give them that feel and then just... Ease them in. I don't think I don't. I think for certain players we should use the, the loan system a lot more. But if there's a certain player you like, a man the manager's got belief in. There's always going to be that one player. Like for Rangnick, it's Alanga. For like for Ollie, it was Voldemort. But for Ten Hag, he's going to have that one player that he will really want in the team. And I think for him, he's done it with Kenneth Taylor this season with Ajax. Ease them in gradually, and I think. There will be one talent next year. Use the Foden approach. Yeah. If you actually hit the nail on the head with that, Reese, and I think um, when you look at the, like, the young players, obviously Hannibal Medjury is probably someone who you look at a Ten Hag style and a Ten Hag system. Hannibal mm -hmm. Medjury is probably one you, Ten Hag may be looking at next season, I hope. Maybe he takes that Foden route, as you said, with, with Hannibal Medjury um, next season. I want to touch on something because Dave brought it up in the comments and I want to bring it to the lads here um, because obviously all three of you have played for Manchester United. You've all put on the shirt and you all know what it means to be a Manchester United player and to represent the football club with professionalism. Jesse Lingard, obviously, his brother has come out this week and Jesse didn't get to play against Brentford the other night. Um, obviously, he's seen Cavani, Phil Jones, Mata and Matic all get their swan songs, all get their farewells. Jesse Lingard feels a bit hard done by but not getting his farewell. Um, obviously, he's been at the club 22 years, hasn't got his farewell. And because he's come out on social media, he's come in for a lot of criticism from the United fan base for disrespecting the football club, obviously due to social media antics and other things like that. But I'm going to come to Lee first on this. 
Lee, when, when you see the Lingard situation this week and you see kind of what spiraled this season in terms of his own antics, the way the club have treated the situation, where are you at with Jesse Lingard in terms of this overall saga, I suppose, that's going on at the moment? It's it, it, it's a hard one for me, Keane. It, it really is. Um, I was at the club, as you know, going on to 12 years. Um and that felt, you know, that felt like a lifetime. I still feel part of the club now and I've not been there for 15, 16 years. So, because I, I grew up at the club. Um, so, to be the double that time, which Jesse has, obviously, all all really he knows is, you know, Man United. Um, so, yeah, I, I can see how he feels a little hard done by that if he is going at the end of the season and he didn't get to, you know, have his, his swan song, as you will, like the rest of them did. I can see, I can see why he feels hard done by, but on the, on the flip side of that, you know the disrespect is shown with the 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 post with the West Ham uh, pictures on and things like that, and disrespecting the club. Then you've got to think, well, you're at a club, you've been there for so long, you've you know you've made a lot of money with this club. Um, you know we should have been probably a little bit more professional and just you know kept quiet and at the end of the season got off and you know gone down as not obviously not a club legend because he's not a club legend, but gone off as. You know, one one of the one of the fans' favourites. If he would have just kept quiet, if you understand what I mean, like a John O'Shea or a Darren Fletcher. You know, we all have fond memories of them. They weren't the world's best, but the, you know, the fan favourites um, because you know they were at the club for so long and they respected the club. Um, it, it's an hard one, mate. It's, it's an hard one. I, I just feel like he probably should have handled it a little bit better. He should have been a little bit more professional. Um, but then again, he probably got promised things when he come back from West Ham. You know that he was going to get the opportunities to start because of the season he had there, and he didn't get them opportunities. So he was probably a bit, for better, looking for better words, pissed off with that. So again, it, it, it's an hard one. In my opinion, he should have been a little bit more professional, um, and he probably would have got his, uh, his his time to say goodbye. So he's kind of shot himself in the foot a little with that. Phil, just obviously on the back of that, like it's it's obviously the second occasion it's happened this season, and I can understand. Um, what Lee's saying in terms of obviously he's been at the club 22 years and part of him is probably upset that he didn't get a chance to say goodbye to Old Trafford in terms of his, his final game. Um, now, wh- 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 whether he plays in the next two away games, we're not sure, but it's for me, I, I feel like it's a bit of a catch-22 because I, I do agree with Lee. I think he was probably promised X, Y and Z by Solskjaer at the start of the season. Obviously, he had COVID, had a couple of injuries and he was in and out of the team, and then on Randick, he's hardly played at all. Um, like where where do you sit in this? Like I can understand from both sides of the fence in terms of the disrespect he showed the football club, but I can also see like when he sees Edison Cavani getting this one song when he's done nothing but just refuse to play and refuse to train for three months. It's kind of a bit of a catch twenty two, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is a difficult one, as you say, because I, I mean. I'm trying to put myself in his shoes and obviously being at the club for so long, it's probably, you know, hurt him in the fact that he's he's not been able to to do that at Old Trafford uh, for, for sort of the last time. Um, but on the flip side of that, I think, you know, as a professional footballer, sometimes you've just got to, you know, man up and, and just accept that, you know, that's part and parcel of, of you know, being a, being a professional. And I think the club aren't obligated to, you know, play him at any given point. I think, you know, they've, they've paid him hundreds of thousands of pounds. They've looked after him, um, you know, and everything that comes with being a, a player at Manchester United. So the, the stuff that he's done probably hasn't helped himself. And whether that's, you know, had anything to do with the way things have panned out, you know, we can only speculate on that. So, um, you know, I think, you know, if he did get his swan song, would it have been, you know, 10, 15 minutes at the end of a game. You know, I don't really see... It's been made sort of more of a, an issue for me than what it what it needs to be. I think, obviously, he's wanted to say his farewell to the fans, which is fine. But he could have done that, you know, in other ways and other means. Um, and I just feel as though it's unnecessary drama again, which is, you know, going as a negative against the club. Because um, I think a few times this year there's been... Well, I don't want to mention some of the other stuff, but there's been a lot of things this year where we've we've had a bad season on the pitch, but there's been a lot of stuff as well off the pitch that's not gone great for us. Um, 
And I think we, we need to try and, you know, refrain away from all that kind of stuff as much as we can because, you know, when you look at these top teams, um, the the professional on and off the pitch, they, they do the right things on and off the pitch. They all work together. They're, they're a team. There's no, you know things going on in the background that are causing an issue on the pitch and and it just feels as though that's where we are as a, a club as a club at the moment with with all the stuff that's that's happened this year so yeah I, I do think like obviously I feel a bit sorry for him that he's not had that opportunity but you know there's been bigger players in the past who's had probably more of an impact at the club who, who never got that opportunity as well so you've got to look at you know players like Rio Ferdinand and people like who is you know an absolute you know rock at the bat for us who you know won countless trophies probably one of the best defenders and I think you know he, he didn't really get you know the send off he wanted either so John O'Shea didn't either like yeah. John O'Shea didn't either so he's not the only one um who's who's not had it so for me you know you just gotta suck it up and and, and move on and, and that's the end of it really I do agree with Dave Cummins, though. He's definitely not the player United needs going forward with his, the way he is and his attitude. Yeah. I don't think he's the player we need at all uh, moving forward. We, we, we need to get rid of that playboy mentality at the club where the, the main focus isn't just playing football. They've got other avenues and other focuses outside. To me, it looks like as soon as they leave that training pitch, the football goes out the head and it's on the brand or it's on something else. And I, I, I feel I, I agree with what Dave's saying there in the comments. It's probably not the players yeah. we need moving forward. Well, you, you've, seen it, you've, seen it today. you've seen it today, though, with that um, the, the video of Pogba, you know, doing the little dancing with the, the calf injury. I think all that kind of stuff. Like, I'm, I'm not saying that you don't enjoy yourself when you're at training, you can't have a laugh, and, and that's all good and well, but there's like ways of doing it, and especially the way that some of these players have performed this year, and the way that, you know, we've been so underwhelming. I think. I'd be embarrassed, me, to, to be doing stuff like that and, and sort of, you know, flaunting myself um, on, on Twitter and TikTok and all that when my performance levels have been nowhere near good enough. I, I, I'd feel, you know, like I'm I'm sort of doing a disservice to, to not just myself, but all the fans who are watching that. They're, they're basically thinking, is this fella taking the piss out of us here? He's, he's doing dancing um, when, you know, he's he's not even, you know... Performed anywhere near the levels he's, he's limped off against Liverpool. It's, it's, it's basically put more effort into his dancing than he's put on the fucking yeah. deal, isn't it? And the, the side and of the square as well. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I get what you mean. So that's where I think a lot of these players nowadays they, they need the, um, the the tunnel vision. Football's your, your main priority, and I think we've got a lot of lads at the club at the moment who's got other things going on outside of football um, that are, that are consuming more of the energy. Where you know it, it's it's showing on the pitch. Yeah, that's what I alluded back to Arteta a couple of, a couple of shows ago when I said like I don't particularly rate him as a manager, but he's taken that trait of Guardiola where if you're a bad egg, you're gone. Like if you don't have like if you do not fit the club in his way, if you don't listen to what he wants, if you have a like I, I, like Keen knows me like my favorite football player growing up was David Beckham like. No, no disrespect on Beckham, but he was the biggest personality, not just in Man United, but English football in between 98 and 2003. There was no player in England bigger than Beckham, with all due respect, in terms of like personality, dominance of like of the field. But even like a player like that, who I grew up admiring, yes, it pained to watch me see him leave, but the right reason was Sir Alex Ferguson, the greatest manager of all time, knew that if Beckham's personality continued to grow, that would supersede him. And with all the respect, it's been like that for a long time. Players controlling the dressing room rather than the manager. Doesn't matter who you are, whether it be Oli or Louis van Gaal or Josie Mourinho, like this club continues to allow players to rule the dressing room where when it should be if the manager's say, regardless if it's a player that fits in, where you come through the academy or you're a, or you're a player signed for like 20, 30, 40 million, the manager's the one in charge of you. And if you don't listen, then you should be gone. And Lingard, like, yeah, I I get like he wanted that send off, but I look back to certain players like your personality, whether you're a good player or you're or you're incredibly average, if you are dominating the, the dressing room in the wrong way, you shouldn't be at the club because it's going to have an impact. And the one thing I hate about the, the our club right now is player power. 
far too much player power and it superseded every manager post Sir Alex purely because they know it's easier to get rid of a manager on like say five, six, seven million pound a year rather than wherever the players earn like on a yearly contract because they know that like we can get away with this. Yeah. I think what it alludes back to just quickly, I don't want to keep harping on about it, but you know, when you touched on Beckham there back in the day, yeah, he had probably, you know, a lot of things going on outside of his football. Um, Mm -hmm. But because of the characters we had in the dressing room and the manager, they was kept to a minimum. And obviously when he was at the football ground, that was his main focus and his football performance never dipped. Whereas some of these other players now, because we haven't got the the manager as such and we haven't got them big characters who are in the dressing room making sure the standards are always kept, you can see it that, you know, people are getting away with doing, you know, doing other things and the concentration levels aren't always there. And that's why the standards have been so fluctuated this season and, yeah. and the consistency levels have been nowhere near good enough. Definitely. Yeah. I hate criticising them, but I always use them as a fair contra- contrast. Yeah, it's fair, it, is, it, is, it is a fair a fair comparison, Reese. You're absolutely bang on there. Um, mm-hmm. Ajmal in the comments here, says hello to Marcus, says big up, hope you're doing well with the coaching. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, man. We have, yeah, but, um, you have my saying also on the on the thing. I think uh, times have changed. You know, I see it also now when I'm training the younger lads. They grow up in a in a in a different world where TikTok and Snapchat and uh, Instagram it's so powerful. And uh, obviously, uh, Phil and uh, Lee, we've been grown up in other other thing other in a different world. You know, we grew up just. After school, we went to play football, you know. In nowadays, there's so many distractions, you know. There, 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 there's so many things to do, you know. You always need input. Like, even if you watch our phones, everybody has to swipe all the time, you know, get new things, you know. It's like, uh, it's it's going all on the, t- on the time, you know. And and I think with the players in nowadays, I think it's it's the same because... That they they don't have that mentality, you know, when they when they step off the pitch, that they have to do everything for their regeneration. But they think, how what can I do now to 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 get more, you know, stimulation? You know, they 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 they, they think they dance, they go parties, they go to restaurants, you know. But 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 uh, reset it quite quite intelligent and wise. What I think, the the coach has to be there, the club has to be there, it has to be controlled. And also when there are players in the dressing room and they tell Paul, hey, Paul, if you dance like a superstar, you also have to play like a superstar. Otherwise, everybody's taking a piss about you, you know. And then maybe he starts to realize "Mm, it's not so clever when I do the dancing video after I limped off uh, two weeks ago in a big game, you know. But but people around Pogba, they, they don't seem to have an influence on him. And therefore, the, the, the young players, they are different compared to us. But they need to be they need to be helped, you know, they need to be educated. And that's mm-hmm. that's a big problem. You know, at City, I don't see players doing videos like dancing when they lose to Liverpool or whatever. And then you can say Guardiola is a freak or control freak or whatever. But I think in nowadays it's much more difficult to handle these kind of situations than uh, 20 years ago, you know. And uh, with Lingard, I think it's a very emotional situation. Because as a footballer, you see everything very emotional, you know, and football is not emotional. Uh, the decisions are always very ra- rational, you know, they, 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 they are depending on money, on situations, and um, therefore the emotions need to stick back, you know. I can, I can understand Lingard, but uh, if he's 10 years older, I think he wouldn't have done it the same way, and he will learn out of it. And yeah, like, like you guys said, Kino didn't have a bad, uh, really good ending. Bex didn't have a good ending, uh, Ferdinand, there were bigger players who didn't have a good ending. And this is football sometimes. It's it's part of your professional career and you need to deal with it, you know. In extent, you get a lot of money and you get a lot of fame. So sometimes you have to, praise, to pay the price for it, you know. I mean, don't, yeah. just, just to add on to that, just a quick one, Marcus, yeah. and I'm sure you'll agree and obviously Phil will agree. Um, the first team when we was there, it, it is good to have character. We had some characters in that first team. You remember the likes of Quinton Fortune, for example, massive joker within the squad, even even to an yeah. extent, Rio, Giggs, yeah. you know what I mean? They all had a great yeah. laugh and a great joke and they had great personalities, but they knew when they went onto that football pitch that like, that's all that mattered and they give 110% and they knew if they stepped out of line with the manager we had and like you say, the senior members of that squad, 
that they would get pulled back in line and they get told, hold on a minute, you know, it's good to have a personality, but make sure you show it on the pitch, exactly what you've said. Yeah. You need yeah. character in the dressing room and you need that, you know, that sort of, that sort of, they, they build the team, if you understand what I mean, when they've got that character. But they also need to have a serious side too and, and understand that. It's good to have that character, but you also, when you put that shirt on, you're, you're first and foremost a Man United player and that's your job and that's what you've got to do and that's what you've got to put 100% into. And like I say, unfortunately, it's a different world we've grown up in now where that's not the mentality anymore. And, and I mean, if you think back, Kino would have ripped him into pieces, you know. Exactly. If Paul would have done that that video, you know, Kino the next day, he would have been on him, you know. So yeah. he wouldn't survive in that changing room. And we have, United has to, 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 to create that ambience, that, that, that uh, mentality again in the dressing room, you know, to get the right players in, get the right coach in, create the work ethic again, you know, and... Then you, you're not talking about a TikTok movie or TikTok uh, whatever, you know, it's it's bullshit. But it, it has to be always seen in the right sense because we're not living 20 years ago. We live in the moment right now and we have to adapt, adapt to the modern world and take all the positive th things with it, but also take care about the negative sides, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know what, guys, you've just articulated that. Well, I'm not even going to give my opinion on it because... You've just all hit the absolute nail on the head, 100%. But I'm getting to my favourite part of the show now, guys, is our predictions for the game. Oh, Obviously, look, Brighton, we beat them 2-0 at, at Old Trafford in the reverse fixture. Um, again, it's probably one of our performances where we didn't perform for 45, but we did for the other 45. Obviously, against Brentford, we've seen a 90-minute performance. Um, but... This is my favourite part of the show. We're going to get our starting 11 predictions and score predictions. And, Mr. Marsh, you have some competition here today now because Marcus has now also joined the panel now. So you have an extra you have an extra head in our competition here this week. Um, so we're all going to give our start, a predicted starting 11s for the game. We're all going to give our score predictions. And then just at the end of the show, um, I'm going to ask each member of the panel... Um, even though, look, we haven't done well this season, but I will get every member of the panel's Man United player of the season. So it, it mightn't take anyone long to think about it, but we will get everyone's um, player of the season um, at the end of the show. But first of all, obviously, starting 11s um, for tomorrow's game. So, Reese, give me your starting 11, 1 to 11, and formation, please. 4-3-3, De Gea, Wambasaka, Varane, Lindelof, Tellez, Fred McTominay, Fred McTominay, Hannibal, Elanga, Ronaldo, Fernandez. 4-3-3, and Marcus looks like Reese has put Fernandez in on the left again today. So yeah. now I'm going to get Marx's starting 11, 1 to 11, and formation. Um, so, Marcus, fire away. Give us your starting 11 for tomorrow's game. Who would you pick? I'm, I'm going completely, not completely with Reese. Um, <laughs> only instead of Fernandez, I would, I would uh, pick a different player. And I would put Fernandez in the midfield and uh, put Hannibal on the bench. On the, on the right wing, yeah, difficult one, difficult one, really. Uh, maybe Jaden Sancho, give him a run out again, maybe. Very interesting, very interesting. So he's going for the same 11, but Jaden Sancho on, 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 on the wing instead of Bruno Fernandes, and Hannibal drops to the bench. So is, 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 uh, is he back fit now? He's... He has, he, he has tonsillitis or something this week. I don't think... He, he's 50-50, but... I've literally, like I, said, I walked in three minutes before the podcast. Normally, I do a bit of uh, research a couple of hours before. I've not even been able to research nothing. Not <laughs> it's okay, Lee. Go with the flow, man. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to pick out who you all pick and then pick a team from that. <laughs> Go on, Lee. Give us, give us your start eleven. Let's see now. Let's see. With I, I like the, I like actually like the lack of preparation because I think you could actually go mad with this eleven. No. I, I, I would I would obviously I, I'll choose the eleven which I feel with if the players are fit what I feel that Ralph will pick. Um so I'd go with David David Zikaya, uh Wan Basaka, 
Varan Lindelof Teles as a back four, uh, midfield three. It's just going to be a, a bog standard Fred McTominay and Fernandez, uh, and up front. I didn't know Sancho was fit um, because I would have probably put. I would have liked seeing Ganacho up there myself, but I don't think he will do. Um, so I think he'll play Ilanga, Ronaldo, and Sancho if Sancho's match fit. Interesting, interesting. But I would, I would, I would have liked to have seen Fernandez. If it was me, I would have put Fernandez at left back. Uh, <laughs> well, not not Bruno, no, not Bruno, no, no Marcus. Really. Alvaro, Alvaro <laughs> Fernandez. He is in the Bruno, squad for tomorrow. He and is and in the put, squad for tomorrow. In, and I would have given Hannibal a run out to in midfield if it was me, because I'd, I'd, I'd like Marcus alluded to earlier. We've, you know, with we, we, we've got to try and have a look at these young lads. It's all about looking at them in an you know, under twenty three setting. But as as the lads will tell you, there's a massive gulf between under twenty threes and first team. So we need to have a look at that. I think he will <laughs> be. A, I think he may be. Funny one, by the way. That's a really funny one. <laughs> I, I, I have to come. In, I have to come in my son's room because uh, it's the only place to get internet. <laughs> 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 I think he will be involved though because he has confirmed he's in the squad tomorrow. Alvaro. Who's that, Tommy Vies? Alvaro Fernandez, he's in the squad tomorrow. It's been confirmed. I'd, I'd like to see him get given a chance because, you like to say, we've, we've, got, to, we've got to have a look at these lads now. It's, it's great, I'm doing well at under 23 level. Yeah. Like I've just said, there's a massive difference between the, it's the a good opponent. And they've, got, they've, got to, they've got to get given a chance at some point. So, yeah, if it was me, he'd be on the left. I'd have Hannibal in the centre and I'd have Gonacho up top. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Look, and I think that I think may, if it's not this game, I think definitely maybe against Palace we will see one or two of them get a game similar to when we played Palace a couple of years ago. I remember Josh Harrop and a couple of others, a couple of the young players did get a game in the last game of the season. I think it could be something similar to that. Phil, I should have switched you up here for your prediction so I didn't give you the benefit of going last again. But looks like you are getting that benefit of going last again. Give me your predicted 11 for tomorrow. Yeah, so I'm I'm gonna go pretty much the same as what the lads have said, but I'm I'm gonna have I think Ganacho is gonna start. I think um, so. I'm gonna go for the same back back four. Obviously, De Gea in net, Wan Bissaka, Varane, Lindelof, Tellers, uh, Fred McTominay, Bruno, and then I'm gonna go Ganacho, Ronaldo, and Alanga. I just feel as though because they've got the youth cup coming as well. If he gets a start, obviously, what a confidence booster that is for him um, just before that big game. Um, and yeah, obviously, you know, to play alongside Ronaldo for him, he, he, obviously, with all the stuff we've seen on social media from, you know, the stuff he's been putting on, he, he's a he's a massive fan, and you know that'd be a, a a great boost for him before that big game next week. Yeah, I agree. But you know what I'd say to you? What's funny about this whole situation? Garnacho's from Argentina and his idol is Cristiano Ronaldo. I think that's the best thing ever. I actually think that's the, the best thing ever. Like I think next time he goes to Argentina training, I think Mr. Lionel will be dragging him into a corner and be like, who's your fucking idol? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? You'll probably see something like that. Show <laughs> My idol was Roberto Carlos, not Ashley Cole. <laughs> It's just well, actually, really, I, I, thought, I thought your I thought your idol would have been like your good mate Paul Kincheski. Well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna give my eleven. Um, I've actually a different back four to everybody. Um, I'm obviously De Gea is in goal by process elimination. I'm gonna go, even though I don't want him there. It's gonna be Diogo Dallo, I reckon. I write back. Um, tomorrow. Oh. I think Cucurella could have a good board. <laughs> Reese is not happy about it, man. <laughs> I don't. I, the thing, I like Dallo, but he's literally just mentioned Cucurella, and I'm like, Dallo no, against no, Cucurella. No, there's only one winner. Me. I saw it. There's saw only it. one. The there's only one there. winner, and I think that kind yeah. of red bull. I think that could be it. If Dallo's on form, that could actually could be a good battle tomorrow. But he hasn't been on form for a while. But look, we'll see. We'll you see. I was going to say Dallo on form. Some things Dallo did in that last game. He looked absolute quality. And then he went and did a, like, the most stupid back pass I've ever seen in my life. And it's like, you just put three or four quality balls in. You look like you're going to start having a good game. And then he just loses it. That is something stupid. Champions yeah. League to conference league. Champions League to conference. <laughs> yeah, it's all in the space of eight minutes. That's a prime for his green. Yeah. Hey, isn't it wrong with for his green? <laughs> 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 right, go on. I'll continue with my 11 anyway. Um, Keep going. Yeah, I'm going to go 
for Anna Maguire. Harry Maguire is back, according to Ralph Ragnick. Um, according to Ralph Ragnick. <laughs> <laughs> According to Ralph Ragnick, Harry McGuire will be in this. Reese is not having it. He's not feeling he, he's it. He's gonna kill me that's after this show. Let's just run it all. I think Harry McGuire will be starting centre back. Police. Yeah, I think Harry McGuire will be starting centre back with um, Raphael Varane go. tomorrow. Um, a left back, I go Tellez. Um, yeah, just again by process elimination. If Luke Shaw was fit, I'd start him, but he's not so. Tellez has to play. Um, midfield three, I'm going to go with my favourite duo in McTominay and Fred. Um, and then I'm going to go Bruno in front of him in the 10. Um, obviously, Ronaldo has to be up top. Alanga. I think Marcus Rashford might be out. I had Rashford in my starting 11 yesterday, but I don't think he'll play. So I'm actually going to go one matter. Um, in the starting eleven, I'm gonna go. Ma- even though I just said, literally, I said on the pod that he, he's number ten. But I reckon if he, him and Bruno, they might keep switching positions. But I reckon one Mata will be in the team. Um, with Alanga and Ronaldo. Um, and look, maybe because Amy's here as well, I had to throw one Mata in the team unless I'm in the doghouse tonight. Anyway, but one Mata is our favorite player, so I have to pick him. You know, but like, <laughs> otherwise there's no food tomorrow, mate. Yeah, I'm not. I, I'm not getting my dinner. I, I, tomorrow, was, but... I was thinking of something else, not food, Marcus. Yeah, I, I just wanted to be polite, you know. I'm a German guy. I wanted to be polite, you know. That was an in, that was an innuendo. Food, food meant something else. Though. Such ger- yeah. such German efficiency. Yeah, exactly. Best thing about them, ger- German efficiency. You don't, you don't yeah, look, in, in all seriousness. <laughs> But in all seriousness, I think, look, it's, if you go from one matter to get a couple of games between now and the end of the season anyway, because obviously, like, look, he's been a good servant to the football club. No, we've all talked about Pogba and Lingard and all that. One matter has never kicked up a fuss. One matter has always remained professional. And one matter, you know, even though last season I did call for one matter to probably be sold because he wasn't getting enough game time and he, he, has a, he had a very big wage. But to be fair to him, he stayed professional and... It'd be, it, it's a shame that we probably didn't get to see him play in his natural position when he signed for the football club. But nevertheless, he has been like you know a model professional. And look, whatever he, I know there is plans for him to be returned to the football club in a coaching capacity um, later on. Um, but look, he will uh, he'd be someone who'll be welcomed back by our fan base and um, in open arms um, in that regard. But we've got all our starting elevens in there. And to be fair, I think I've just Reese has lost his will to live after hearing my eleven. But look, there you go. Um, I think that's the eight pints kicking him. We're no yeah, longer it's, friends. It's, 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 I think that's the Peroni kicking in um, <laughs> for Reese there. But um, we'll get our score predictions in, and then I, I, there's actually a question in the live chat for Lee, which I will bring up just at the end of the podcast because it's a very positive point. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, I'm going to do a quick fire score prediction, but this time I'm not starting with Reese. I'm not giving Phil the chance to get his score prediction in last. So, Mr. Marsh, you're going up here now. Shocking. Okay. You're getting your score prediction first here, my friend. By the way, do I get a prize for being like getting the most correct scores this year? Or is the. Um, you might have to talk to Wayne about that because Wayne's obviously the owner of the channel. You might have to talk to Wayne about a prize. Yeah, it's in LA. Phil, they're, they're, you're going to you know, bring there is a prize. Phil, you, 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 you get a prize. Phil, you get a prize. Phil, you get a prize. There is a prize. I'll end up paying a prize. I'll end up paying a 10 for that one. Like the, there is a prize and I just thought about it. Your, your prize, you just get the privilege of just being here without with a baby face. Oh, well, <laughs> Good enough for me. No, I actually I'm gonna go for um I'm gonna go for a two one. I think Ooh. off the back of a good performance against Brentford. Um I think you know, momentum now, nothing really to play for. So I'm just gonna go for a solid two one. I'm gonna say Ronaldo to sc- because obviously I've said my aim now for the end of the season is is for Cristiano to continue with his 20 league goals. Um so I'm hoping that he will will achieve that. I think he needs two goals from his last two games um, in the league. So I'm going to say 2-1, Ronaldo to score and Alanga to score. 
Interesting. Interesting. I hope Ronaldo breaks that too. Again, 37 years of age and probably most dysfunctional Man United team of the Premier League era. And he's still scoring 20 D goals. The problem, eh? The problem. Not a bad problem. Not a bad problem to have, as Roy Keane said the other night. Exactly. Reese, give me your score prediction, my friend. Same one as last night, 4 1 United. 4 1 United. Ooh, confidence personified, and it's not the Peroni speaking. No. Mr. Lawrence, what is your score prediction for tonight, pal? For, for tomorrow, pal, sorry. 2 0. I'm going to, I'm going to, because I've been crap at these score predictions all season. I'm going to actually say that we're going to do a nil. We're going to keep a clean sheet, which I don't believe for one minute, but I'm, I might as well carry on being crap at them. So I'm going to say that we're going to keep a, keep a clean sheet and we're going to score two goals. I'm going to go for Ronaldo, obviously. And I'm going to go for my best mate, Fred. He's going oh, to pop up with a, an absolute worldie in the top bin. So that's what I'm going for. Two nil, Fred and Ronaldo. I forgot to give score predictions, actually. I said Ronaldo hat trick and Fred to score last night. <laughs> I've actually yeah. got the same mindset as you. I said the same thing. <laughs> Look, it's all the it's all the one you can't go back on it now, Reese. But yeah, I don't Marcus, I, I will increase my pastorship. <laughs> Marcus, give me your score prediction. Um, I'm, going, I'm going for two nil as well. Um, Ronaldo and Ilanga two zero. We're gonna have a away win, and uh, that would be. Good to have two clean sheets in a row. Uh, hopefully with uh, Lindelof and uh, with Varane in the, at the back that they keep their consistency would be perfect to see. And uh, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, I think it, it, I think a clean sheet w- is well needed because we haven't got many of them this season. We've conceded a lot of goals, but I can't believe I, I just, I'm, I'm going to stick with my score prediction that I was saying to Reese yesterday. Um. I'm going 3 1 United. Um, I do think we will concede a goal. I do think it's going to be off a set piece as well, because that's what we, we, we've conceded a lot of them this season. And the only reason I say it is my fellow countryman Shane Duffy plays for Brighton and he scores a lot of set pieces, both for club and country. He's brilliant from set pieces. And if he comes up against Lindelof at set piece tomorrow, it's like Avengers Endgame. It's just going to be over. Like, do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I'll go 3-1. I'll go Ronaldo to get a double and I'll go Cavani off the bench. I think Cavani will probably come on and score as well. And yeah, I know it's, Reese, I know what you're thinking, Cavani playing a game of football. I know it's it's, it's a rarity these days, but um, yeah, I'll go Cavani off the bench to come on and score. Um, I want to keep Dave's question here just for the closing point of the show, but I'm going to get a quick fire answer from everyone on the panel. I'll go from Marcus upwards up to Phil. Give us your, your play. I know it hasn't been a great season. It's been a disappointment by many accounts. Give me your player of the season, Marcus, for United this season. Definitely a longer. I think uh, in a season like this, you always, uh, if you have a disappointing season, you're always looking for young players. And um, him and Hannibal, obviously, they were Hannibal for the game. Um, we all know he made a big impact, you know, and he showed us what the club is about in these few minutes. But I think Elanga has a really good run in uh, in a lot of games this year, and he's done well for the time that he has been given. And I think he should be supported, and therefore I think for him um, it's the right choice, even even with the intention to show that none of the uh, older or experienced players turned up this season. Um, I mean, you could talk about De Gea, but but I think if 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 you have to name one guy who deserves it, in my in my opinion, it's definitely Ilan. He's definitely been one of the few, I suppose, shining lights in a very poor season, and he is a good show, to be fair. And um, with Anthony Alanga, he's been a revelation under Ralph Rangnick since he's come in. Lee, yeah. who would be your player of the season this season? Uh, between three. Uh, I wrote it there when you said at the beginning that you were going to ask us this, so I've had a little bit of thinking in the podcast that it would be the three half jewels. Um, David De Gea has saved us on many occasions again. Um, he's up there. Uh, has a, a sheer amount of effort, and I would say improvement this year uh, would be Fred. And just for being the best of all time and still scoring as many goals as he has done, Ronaldo's got to be in there with a shout too. Um, but I'm going with I'm going with De Gea. I'm going to go with the keeper. I'm going to go with David De Gea. I think um, 
is is if we if want to pull off some of the saves he has done, you know, where, where would we be? I mean, you could say with Ronaldo's goals too, but I think he's been immense for a couple of seasons now, and he's been he's been there a long time, and I think he's, he's had a real good season for us. So I, I'm going to go with a goalkeeper, mate. I'm going to go with De Gea. So we have two different players. So we have we have Alanga, we have De Gea, Reese. Who's your player? Uh, to be honest, I've, here? I've been thinking about it as well. To be honest, same as Lee, a couple of options. Um, Lindelof, for me, has been our best centre-half all season, although a lot of people will question that. I will just correctly tell them they're wrong. Um, Fred, another one for me, phenomenal all season. He gets so much stick oh. like, for literally just doing his job and just sums people up for me like their low mindset that they continue to harass this player when he's he's a fantastic young he's a fantastic player I was about to say young player but he's not but everyone says Lingard's young so Fred's young too. Um Langa for me I agree with Marcus like Langa's been a revelation. I think to a degree I think at times he's been overplayed. Not his fault but that's a testament to his hard work. What can I say for a teacher's pet? I mean, nothing wrong with that. He works hard. And another one, consistent professional for me is Ronaldo. But for me, I think the overall consensus is it will probably be Ronaldo's player of the season. But for me, it's Fred. I think when when it comes to what really matters, Fred, since the start of the season, whether it be under Solskjaer or whether it be under Rangnick, even like he's had his injury spells, a lot of inconsistent performances. But the one thing Fred gives every single week is professionalism. And now people say, like, oh, like, Fred is not good enough to be in a title-winning team. Yeah, true. True. But are Man United a title-winning team? Hell no. But when you actually think about what a team's about, hard work, professionalism, puts a shift in, understands the club, any manager that comes into a club will want a player like Fred. He only has to work on a few things, and that's, like, passing and understanding, like, positioning and a little bit of physicality. But when he's played in certain games, yeah, he's a bit, yeah, he's a bit crazy, like Eric Bailly. But I, just in terms of just watching him and he's if he's understanding of the club and his attention to detail, since he went to Brazil for that first international break at the end of last year, Fred's been Fred's been absolutely phenomenal this year, consistently for me. So, yeah, I'm going to stand my gun. I'm going to say play the season for me is Fred. Three different choices. I was going to do a Twitter poll on the Talk to Devils Twitter page, and you and your left four players on it. So, <laughs> Phil, who's your player of the season? Strikers Union. I'm I'm going to say CR7. Uh, just just be, because obviously the lads have all touched on you know great um, options as well. I think the the rightly justified in what they've said about you know Alanga, De Gea, and Fred. But for me, um, I just feel. Cristiano again this year um, at the age of 37 to be doing what he's doing um, in the Premier League in a, in a really average team. It just speaks volumes about, you know, the level of ability and, and sort of the sort of relentless nature that he's got to, to be the best that he can be. Um, don't get me wrong, I think a few times this year he's let himself down in certain games where his attitude's not been quite right, where he's maybe... You know, stormed off the pitch and and not really, you know, led by example um, in 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 the right manner. But I think that's just pure frustration with the fact that he's probably not played his best, or that the team's not been good enough, and the standards that he has have not been been sort of upheld. But for me, just to sort of reiterate what I've said, to score that many goals this year at that age, and to still, you know, be be. Um, as good as he is, although he's not as mobile, I think he, he makes up for it in other other ways. And I, and I just feel as though he's been, you know, a big player at big moments when we've needed a goal. He's been the person that's, you know, cropped up and, and found that goal. And if, if, if you think about where we would be without the goals that he scored this year, you know, it, it'd be, you know, an absolute car crash of a season. So, yeah, as I said, Strikers Union stick with... Uh, the main man, and I'm going Cristiano. Yeah, I'm just going to go on the back of that. Ronaldo's my player of the year straight away. Um, yeah, everything you basically said, Phil, th and 37 years of age, 24 goals in the most dysfunctional United team in the Premier League era. That speaks for itself. And look, to be fair, all the other players who mentioned, Fred Alanga and De Gea, they've all probably been the shining lights in the very poor season 
And um, let's be honest, like last two seasons, I would have said Bruno all day, but unfortunately, even though his transfer creation has been good, he's just let us down too much, too many times. So Bruno's not in it for me. But that's the final topic of the night. We will have, we will put a poll up on the Talk of the Devils Twitter page, and you guys, our subscribers, can make a vote for yourselves in terms of who Man United's player of the season is. But a question came in from Dave Lee and. I just want, because obviously in the 2003 U Cup team, you obviously went and won the FAU Cup. Man United are in the FAU Cup final this year at Old Trafford. Um, it's actually going to be on Old Trafford this year. We're playing Nottingham Forest. Last week when I spoke to you, Man United sold 38,000 tickets for the game, which means it's, it was going to be, sorry, 35,000, which means it was going to be second most attended U Cup final of all time. Man United have now sold 54,000 tickets and counting for the FAU Cup final at Old Trafford. How, how do you think these boys will be feeling when they run out, over, uh, run out to over 54,000 people at Old Trafford for an FAU Cup final? Mate, it's, I, I, can't, I can't describe to you the way that would make you feel. Um, you are, everybody knows the, FA, the FAU Cup is a massive, massive footballing club tradition with Man United you know you speak to all the great players from United who's grown up there um, one of the most you know valuable memories and what they value the most is winning the FA Youth Cup and, and you know Gavin Neville will tell you that the class of 92 will tell you that you know one of the first things they always mention is actually winning the FA Youth Cup because that's when you start realising your own potential and you start realising that do you know what the, this dream I've had from being a kid for so long is now becoming a reality for them lads to go and step out in front of fifty-two thousand people at Old Trafford, you know, it's 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 going to be a memory they're going to have for the rest of their lives. That will never go. I mean, when I played in the FA Youth Cup final, and obviously we was lucky enough to you know to go on and win that, um, and we played in front of a decent crowd. Don't get me wrong, and it, it, you know, unfortunately, I, like you all know, I finished at um, twenty-one years old with, with injury. So it's probably one of one of if not the best memories of football I, I've actually ever had. Um, and it's a memory that you know I I, I hold dearly. Um, now, if that that memory was played in front of fifty or thousand that you know at Old Trafford, then it, it's just it, it words can't describe what, what a phenomenal feeling that's going to be for the lads. And you've got to also give props to the to the, the fans and the supporters too for them to support our youth team in, in in such a way is is absolutely fantastic. And it's showing what you know we've still got that fan base there. What's going to support the team and. Support us through, you know, the good times and the bad. Um, granted, they probably just want to watch United in a final and ho- hopefully win something for a change. Um, but no, it, it's going to be, it's going to be absolutely a night they'll never forget, mate, and a memory that they'll all dear for the rest of their lives. I'd imagine. Thought we played at a bad time for United. Then I'm just realizing, bloody hell. <laughs> That's why I think none of the youngsters will play this game against Brighton. I think they'll be rested for next Wednesday. Um, you know, I think it's um, it, it's it's great to see. Or like the fact of the matter is, they're actually selling more tickets for this game now. Like there's still tickets on sale. They're after opening up the third tier in Old Trafford and Sir Alex Ferguson stand. Imagine if they can get to close to seven full capacity. It'd be it'd be stuff of beauty, wouldn't it? Like to see full capacity in Old Trafford for an FAU Cup final. But it just shows where the U team is at the moment and how good they are. And look, hopefully they can go on and hopefully win the final. And look well, next Friday. We're having a great conversation about it. Yeah, it would you, well, aren't we? I mean, it was the class of '92, and then was it '95? We won it after that, so that was quite close. And then I think it was us in 2003, and then it was 2011. Mm-hmm. So we had like, jumped a decade, and now we're like jumping a decade again. So we're definitely due yeah. one. You know what I mean? And with the team we've got, there's no reason why we can't win and win that. Yeah, I think a great motivation for them, like for the the team coming on Wednesday. Thank God I took the full week off. Um, I think the best motivation for them would be just show them the first five FAU Cup finals. The first five that <laughs> we won. Uh, what can I say? Like That's something that will forever be. Real Madrid can have the first five European Cups. We don't care. We've got the first five FAU Cups. Well, well, poor comparison, but it's still entertainment. But we've done the first five. I think you should just remind them, just saying, like, this is what we've done. Don't have to compare yourselves, but just think you could get yourself into that you could put yourself edge of stone and like teams generations before you have done this 
now is your chance. I think, I think what they've got Go to realise too, and, and I'm sure they will, that if you know if you have a good a good run in the FA, you've caught you know and you you play well in it, and obviously if you eventually go on to win it, it like springboards your career to the next level straight away. If you're an FA Youth Cup winner, uh, I know yeah. in my team, like I think I have mentioned it a couple of times when we won it, I think there was four or five of us what got our European first team squad numbers, which was massive straight off the back of winning it. We had a, mm-hmm. a European you know top in our hands with our name on the back. I had Lawrence thirty eight. You felt part of Man United's first team. Do you understand what I mean? It, it, that that was yeah. the level it propelled you to. So you've been used to playing under 17s, 18s, to then getting on the back of programs and things like that. You know, it, it, it makes you feel yeah. that you, you're realizing your dream. And you know, yeah. some of these lads know it's it's the perfect opportunity for them. You know, to to, to push and uh, Phil's mentioned it quite a few times on the podcast over over the, the months. What a time to be playing for Man United youth with the uh, the current crop, crop of starting 11 that we've got because if there's ever a time for the youth to be pushed it's no so they've got a massive opportunity yeah. ahead of them yeah yeah 100% and look I may speak to Wayne and we actually may have a podcast about the game during the week we should have it we'll have a private conversation and we'll we'll get something organised before that game next week I think it'll be it'll be great. on Sky Sports wouldn't it they normally play it on Sky Sports don't they the yes it'll be on MUTV yeah, I think MUTV as well Um. But we, we, we shall get that covered. But we're going to wrap it up there today, this evening, guys. It's been absolutely fantastic. And look, as I said, we'll have a conversation before the FAU Cup in uh, in terms of the game. And um, look, hopefully United go out and win it. But thanks very much to Phil, Reese, Lee and Marcus for coming on this evening. It's actually great to see Phil, Lee and Marcus reunite there for the first time in 15 years. Great to see all the lads meet each other again. That That's actually great to see them all here talking about United. So it's absolutely fantastic. But... Thanks very much, everyone, for watching. Don't forget to hit a like the video, hit that subscribe button, hit the bell notification right below, Marcus. But until then, guys, thanks very much for watching. Hope you all have a good weekend. Hope you like your three points. And most importantly, most importantly, make sure, Reese, you have a, a pint of water for, before you go to bed so you're not hung up in the morning. But until then, guys, thanks very much, and we'll see you tomorrow.